intangibles, as we have said oftentimes, is based on gross estimates of what the dollar benefit might be uh, for some particular uh, recognized benefit. Um, and once, once you realize that you're talking about gross estimates uh, that maybe are accurate to plus or minus 50%, and sometimes that's even good to get that close, why would it make any sense uh, to go into great detail on the cost side or on the tangible benefits side if you know that the decision is going to be swung primarily based on intangibles and those estimates um, are not very accurate at all. And then let's talk a little bit about the future of ROI for IT. Bruce Barlag, president of Hackett Group, has said that CIOs will find their compensation directly linked to ROI. In other words, um, a CIO uh, is going to have part of his or her compensation computed based on the magnitude of the ROI that is being projected for new IT projects as well as the post-deployment audit revealed accuracy of those um, ROI projections. And why would Bruce Barlag of the Hackett Group say such a thing? Why would he make such a prediction about the future? The answer is, is because in some industries, they're already doing that. Um, and so that's not even future in some places. But the trend is expected to spread uh, to nearly all industries. Um, and then CIOs and vendors will begin to truly collaborate on ROI analysis and tie vendor co compensation to achieving financial returns. Now there's an interesting thing, uh, that the vendor will be, based, will be paid, um, based at least partly but significantly, on whether or not the promised ROI was actually delivered. Um, and then David Axon, the managing director of the Hackett Group, says Wall Street analysts, rating agencies, and banks will begin using an evaluation of IT ROI as they determine a company's viability, its future prospects, the credibility of its forecasts, and its ability to deliver customer and shareholder value. We will find a way to close the gap between projected ROI and actual ROI and track it in near real term, near real time. Um, so the picture that we get here is as important as doing good ROI analyses have been in the past, it's going to become even more important in the future. As important as it's been for um, IT professionals to understand how to do ROI analyses in the past, it's going to become even more important for them in the future. And tools and methodologies will be developed um, so that, that ROI can be tracked in real time. We can get a much clearer picture as we move along and to exactly what the benefit is um, for a particular project. Then let's talk a little bit here about the soft side trends for ROI. Um, by the year 2007, uh, which is um, probably about the time that may not be the future for some of you who are, who are seeing this uh, presentation, 90% of companies will budget for the cost of culture change and factor that into the ROI equation. Companies will no longer turn a blind eye to having billions of dollars worth of technology sitting unused in closets due to adoption resistance uh, by people in the company. Um, so um, when it comes to calculating benefits, chief financial officers have been assessing tangible and intangible benefits for years, but it's it's made an issue only by IT folks and consultants who know little about finance. During the next uh, few years here, we'll see finance departments mandating a common structure and consistency when assessing benefits. If you're an IT person today, dig out your old finance textbooks and start reading. Um, 
And then as a closing uh, thought here to the lecture, um, we have lectures coming up in the future in this course that will talk explicitly about project management offices. Um, and so we'll, we'll uh, explore that in much greater detail uh, later in the course. But for right now, let's consider what the benefit of a project management office might have in this whole business of ROI analyses. Um, specifically, a uh, project management office would work to eliminate project redundancies, standardize the delivery processes, assess and communicate ROI. Again, communication across the whole company uh, is an important aspect of doing good ROI analysis, and avoiding the latest, greatest uh, syndromes. And then project offices will include managers from multiple business units, project specialists, um, and then project analyst uh, that does the ROI calculation. So you will begin to develop specialists within the corporation. Their only job is doing ROI calculations and analyses. And so you would expect that they would become very experienced and very proficient at this uh, and that the, the slop or the error, so to speak, in the process would continue to be reduced as time progresses. And then project office funding usually pays for itself with savings and improved communications. Again, we'll talk about that uh, later in this course. Um, now let's take a brief look at why technology ROI models usually fail. There are three reasons why using, uh, simply using ROI will not result in cost-effective, high-performance technology environments. The first, which we've really already touched on, um, is people aren't peripherals. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute here. Overall system complexity isn't free. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail here in a minute. And people don't know what they don't know about the future. Um, so people aren't peripherals. Oftentimes ROI models do not include the cost of gaining eventual user acceptance. Um, and um, so what, is, what does it take to ensure that an IT project is going to have eventual end user acceptance? Well, there are tried and true methodologies and strategies for doing that. That doesn't have to be a risky part of the project. But in order for it to not be a risky part of the project, it has to be addressed explicitly and budgeted for. Uh, there's special training. There's special PR, advertising. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a way to do that that takes the mystery out of it and makes it very predictable. And you can guarantee end user acceptance or virtually guarantee end user acceptance. Uh, but it's something that has to be planned for and budgeted for by people who know what they're doing. Um, and then an example here is Salesforce automation tools. Uh, it's not useful if it's not used by everyone. It's not trusted by salespeople. Um, if it's not trusted by salespeople, it won't be useful. And um, if it's not used by sales management, uh, it won't be useful. Uh, and so all of those are things that would have to be explicitly addressed in a project proposal and budgeted for as part of the cost of the project. Uh, reason number two, overall system complexity isn't free. Um, the accumulation of many small projects, each carefully cost justified, becomes a giant hairball of manageability and expense. Um, and those are the kinds of expenses that weren't considered in the ROI analyses for the individual projects. Uh, so how do you address this challenge? Well, there are um, standard ways to do that. Certainly having an enterprise um, IT architecture um, and, and addressing it from the perspective of uh, standardization, um, simplicity, um, addressing costs of proliferation, streamlining maintenance. I mean, those are all aspects.